Looks like we're ready to go. Okay. A few years back, I was having a one-on-one -on -one with a manager, and I was trying to explain to him some of the problems that people on our team were having. We had an unusual leadership structure at the time. We were a startup and we were growing fast. People were a little bit confused about the different roles and expectations. So I was talking to him, and I was like, hey, at the next engineering meeting, I think that we should clarify these roles to everyone and tell them what the expectations are. Which I know it was a radical suggestion, but I went there. The response that I received from him, an executive level manager, was that he wasn't comfortable standing up in front of everyone and talking. I was like, that's a bold statement given your job title, uh, which is it involves communicating with people nearly constantly. But what followed was something I can only describe as complete manager action. While this problem I brought forth was relatively inane and simple, not the most egregious of problems, his behavior was, of course, not an isolated incident. No matter what the severity or importance of the issue that he was brought, an action was almost always what followed. And so my meetings with this most ineffective of managers got me thinking, if we built software the way we manage people, we would never ship code. Or if we built software the way that this does people, we would never ship anything. But recently, I've been thinking about things more positively, and I turned this thought in its head and I wondered, well, what if we manage people the way that we build code? And so, I came up with this very clever idea of agile people management. So my name is Kate Heddleston. I'm a software engineer in San Francisco. Uh, sometimes I blog about people management. If you get bored during this talk, you can always go to my blog about me. Uh, it's everything you never wanted to know about me. And you can always follow me on Twitter, I'm Heddleston on Seven. I sometimes tweet about my blog or my blog post. And that's pretty much it. So first, what is agile management? Agile management is a framework for solving problems quickly and iteratively. It involves continuous planning, testing, and integration, and rapid and flexible response to change. So at this point, you might be thinking, this sounds very familiar. In fact, Kate, I think you might have stolen pretty much everything you just said from somewhere else. And the answer is yes, I did. I stole all of this. I went from the Agile Manifesto website, and I literally copied things verbatim and just took out the software portion of it. And I did this on purpose. I did this for two reasons. First, I'm not actually clever enough to come up with the idea of agile development on my own. And second, to show you that software engineers have all of the tools they need to solve human problems, they just need to apply them to the medium of solving people problems. And at this point, I would like to issue a disclaimer. I'm probably not the first person to have thought of agile people management. I this might be the person who got a little too zealous in copying the Agile Manifesto, and I came up with my own Agile Management Manifesto for people. So, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the Agile Software Development Manifesto, you can go to agilemanifesto.org. And it's basically a set of values to use when thinking about Agile Software Development. And so, for Agile Software Development, it involves things like working software over comprehensive documentation. You know, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So I came up with a list for people managers. And these are things like management as a service over a position of power, which is actually the, the first two talks. Employee well being over manager self promotion. Communicating ideas over implementing ideas. And finally, solving employee problems over a version of change. And as the Agile Manifesto website says, it's not that there is no value in the items on the right. It's that while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. So for this talk today, I want to focus on the very last item of my agile manifesto that ties back into a story about my ineffective manager. We're going to focus on solving employee problems over a version of change. And how do we do this? An iterative approach to implementing change is my suggestion. So, I came up with a diagram that has some arrows and circles, as we do for software engineering. And I was like, this is how you connect solve change in an organization. It has three stages implementing change, feedback and monitoring, and assessing problems and solutions. So, depending on where you start in this circle, uh, 
one of these to be the first or the last step. But we're going to start with implementing change. So, the only real way to implement change is to get everyone on board. You can't affect change by yelling at people if they don't want to listen. You can't get everyone to test out a new process or a new system for programming if they don't want to do it. And from the use of software engineers and the software engineers, you know that they tend to be fairly stubborn and independent. So the only thing that you can do is go to everyone and say, hey, this is the change that's happening. I need you to be on board. Can you help make this, this come true? So if you're adding new processes to the development cycle or you're requiring each pull request to have a certain number of code reviewers, all of those different things require employee buy-in. It's not enough to just go and tell them what to do. Next, feedback and monitoring. Your feedback matters. It's your job as a manager to know what is going on with your employees. One of the passive and ineffective management practices that I often see is this idea that employees are responsible for bringing information to you. And to a certain degree, that's true, but it's not enough. This idea that employees are responsible for all of the communication and monitoring is wrong. It is your job as a manager to make sure that you know everything that is going on with your system of people. What are they thinking? How are they feeling? What are they thinking about how they're feeling? What are their thoughts on the recent changes that you just made? How was their breakfast this morning? Pretty much anything that you think is relevant to the running of the organization is important to you to know. And one of my big pet peeves is the question, how are things? I had this for my first couple of years of one on one. How are things? How are things? I was like, these are fine, I guess. And she said, they're going, they're working. It's totally being fixed, no one said. A better question to ask is, how are you? And I told them, I was like, you never ask me how I am, you ask me how things are. And it's like, things are very different from myself. Like, I am something that is important, hopefully, to you. And I want to tell you about me, but you have to ask about it first. It's your responsibility to make sure that the channels of communication are open at all times, especially when things are good. So, one on ones are a really common channel for feedback. But there's a lot of different ways to get feedback from people. These channels of communication have to be open for good things because it can't just be open in the case of bad things. It is really difficult for somebody to come to you with bad information, with a problem. They might feel like they're being a burden. They might find it really hard to articulate the problem. Establishing the trust and rapport around good things is a huge part of making sure that the channels are open for bad things. If the only time that you approach someone or they approach you is to talk about negative things, you will associate them with negativity. Has anyone ever had a manager or a person at work where when they walk towards your desk, you just go like this? Go like this on the hill, and something bad has happened. You don't want that. And the way that you do that is by constantly communicating all the time. And the way I describe it is this. You don't turn off bug tracking just because you don't have any current bugs in your system. You don't stop monitoring your server's uptime. You don't start, stop looking at what's going on with your customer logs just because everything's okay now. And you don't stop having one-on-ones with people just because they say everything is okay. You don't stop asking questions just because they seem like they're fine. Because when something bad happens, it's often sudden and unexpected, and you want to make sure that you know about it right away. The final step in the process is assessing problems and solutions. So, coming up with a clear system for assessing whether the change works or not. And this is based on the feedback that you get, what people have told you about what's going on. And it's really important because, as so many of you have had happened in the past, you've brought a problem to a manager, they've done something about it, but it was just wildly wrong. They either didn't hear the problem correctly, or they tried to put a bandit on a bullet hole, as a very wise woman. <laughs> I talked to us about lately, it's not good enough. So if someone has a really big problem and you try to slap on a solution that's inadequate, they're not going to like that. Similarly, if they come to you with a specific problem and you try to implement a change that's completely different, they're going to feel like you didn't listen. Spending time to truly understand someone's problem, to assess the solutions, and to come up with the best solution you and your team can think of is essential to the entire process of being a manager. So let's go through this with an example. Let's say you want engineers to have better test coverage. Kind of a simple goal, right? You may or may not want this in your current organization. 
So you decide your, your team needs to write more tests. And then you go to your team and you're like, hey, everyone, we should write more tests. So we're going to do that, right? Everybody's like, okay. You're like, good call. And you monitor the situation because, you know, you're the manager. You ask people for feedback. And you see that absolutely nobody wrote more tests. Which is shocking because you remember the meeting where you were like, hey, everyone, we should write more tests. So you're like, okay, apparently that wasn't effective enough. I didn't actually implement any change. So you think about it some more, and you decide, I don't really want to police my employees. I'm going to automate this process, which I think is a great idea. Automate it. Make the computer the bad guy. And so you're like, I'm going to create a code coverage tool that shows PR as their code coverage. And you can either write this yourself, and you're really excited to write some code for the first time in six months. Or you can delegate it to a good, a good time management manager. But now you have this tool. It actually checks the code coverage and pull requests and fix that whenever someone opens a pull request. So test coverage increases, and you're like, okay, that's cool, like that actually did something. But you still don't have a very clear idea of what your goal was in the first place. So you, you sit down and think about the and you're like, 85% code coverage. <laughs> that's our goal. We're going to get the 85% code coverage, and it's going to be amazing. You can go to the team and you're like, yeah, I can't be merged unless we get 85%. And merging comes to an absolute halt. People are like, this is terrible. You just send that 85% code coverage. It's really hard to get to, especially if you have legacy code. So now your team is really dissatisfied with the situation. You're like, okay, well, that didn't work. So again, you think about it some more, and you're like, all right, 70% code coverage. Lowering the bar is not always a bad thing. Now, PR can't be merged without 70% code coverage, and it turns out this one is working. PRs are getting merged, people are happily merging them, everyone feels really good about the increased test coverage, and on the plus side, you still don't have to be the bad guy because the, the tool is doing all of the alerting around the code coverage. So the whole point of this process is to take the same iterative, iterative approach that we have for software development to people management. Because at the end of the day, these are just problems that we want to solve. We have some sort of desired outcome, and we want to find a way to get there. And most of us have imperfect solutions the first time around, so we probably need a couple of tries at it. One of the pushbacks that I often hear about this system is that mistakes with people are more expensive than mistakes with code. If you implement something on your team and they're happy about it, that that mistake is irrecoverable, that you lose reputation, um, and that your credibility can be damaged. And that's not entirely true. In fact, I think most of the time that's false. One of the great things about people is that they are willing to forgive an enormous number of mistakes and fallibilities if they believe that you care about them. But we still love our siblings and our parents. <laughs> the most important thing that you do as a manager is to make sure that the people that you are managing know that you care about them and by extension their problems. And if they come to you with a problem and they tell you about it and they get no response, even if you were struggling in the background to solve it, even if you were just tickled by an action because you didn't really know what to do, the way they perceive that is they don't really care about you. And managers are the number one reason that people leave companies, and one of the top reasons that people cite that they leave managers is because they don't believe that they care about them. So when someone comes to you with their insecurities with their problems, no matter how small it is, showing them that you care and trying to fix it, even if it's imperfect, is better than doing nothing. So now we're going to get to the crux of why I actually think this topic is really important. And I usually bury these reasons secretly later on because I want to set up the idea that this is important to do in a general sense before I get to this topic. Diversity problems are just a subset of management problems. Diversity problems, which involve things around gender, race, whatever else it is, are just human problems. And they can be solved the same way that any human problem can be solved, which is identifying the core issues and iteratively trying to make it better. If a manager isn't equipped to deal with small general problems, what are they going to do when someone comes to them with a really egregious issue? So, you know, in my intro story, I think my manager about clearer communication. I think we need to more clearly communicate something. It's not that big of a deal. At the end of the day, that wasn't really you know, the biggest issue that we ran up against. 
There are other times in my career that I've gone to managers and I'm like, there are issues with sexual harassment. There are issues with um, just general sexism in the meeting. The way that we are training our managers is not good enough. And these are much bigger problems. And they're really, really important. And we have to be able to solve them. Because if people don't think that you care about them when you do not think about their problems, imagine what groups of people think when they come to you with their problems and you do nothing. Which is a lot of the state of diversity in the tech industry. So you've got groups of people who are able to articulate their problems. Women, people of color, uh, transgender. They actually are saying, we have these issues. We can tell you about them. This is what's happening. And the response that they are getting largely from managers and from the industry is silent. And I know that people care. I do. I absolutely, and I know these problems are incredibly hard to solve. So I have a huge amount of compassion for what that takes. But the only way that we are going to get to a place where we have diverse teams that work really well together is if we identify the core issues, we imperfectly work to iteratively solve them. Because trust me, I'm not going to hit a home run out of the gate, and that is okay. So finally, to sum it all up, this is my Agile Manager Manifesto. Communicating ideas over implementing ideas. Management as a service over a position of power. Employee well-being over manager self-promotion. And then solving employee problems over a break in the chain. We talked about solving employee problems over a break in the chain. And all of the other ones are very important and will get touched on throughout the rest of the day. But having principles and approaching how you are actually being a manager day to day is important. Just like having a philosophy for how we develop software and ship it is just as important as the day to day details around um, like tracking, commit, deploying, forward slash, etc. So I, I hope that in the future you will think about doing this whenever someone comes to you with a problem. Get feedback, monitor the situation, make sure that you really listen to people, you understand what's going on. Assess the situation, assess the problems, assess the solutions, get help wherever you need it to solve these things. You don't have to do it alone. And then finally, actually implement change. And I know that that is terrifying, and I know that it's horrible when you mess up with a manager, especially if you make someone cry. But do it anyway, because it's more important that we work to make things better in our industry than it is that we worry about what we do when we mess up. So that's all I have for you today. My name is Kate Edison, and I think we have more time for questions.